Good morning, everyone. Just waiting on a few more persons to join before we start. Okay, good morning again. We are going to start now. Um, we'll be looking on module one. We will not be able to complete module one in its entirety today, but um, we're aiming to look on objective one. Well, that's what I have um, prepared for today. Objective one, and we will be looking on the other objectives in between this week and next week. All right, so for module one, it focuses on the fundamentals of computer science. The objectives are as follows.
I think there is a delay. So I may be a little bit behind or we are. Um, all right, so these are the objectives for module one. It's one, two, three, four, five, five objectives as you can see here. The good part about it is that objective one is the longest one. It has a lot of content as it relates to the other components. Um, yeah, not so much. Objective number two, yes, but not for the others. All right, so let's get into it. So the first aspect that we are going to look on is the difference between a computer and a computer system. So I need you all to be very interactive in the chat. So let me hear from you. Do not use Google straight from your head. You're in the exam. You're asked this question. Differentiate between a computer and a computer system. What would be your response? What's the difference between a computer and a computer system? All right, no response. All right, so here we have, what is a computer? So on the screen, you're seeing that a computer is an electronic device, and that is something that we must um, put as a part of our definition. It is a compute, it is an electronic device that is used to carry out different tasks. These tasks would include computations and making logical decisions. No, we know that technology is constantly evolving, and that is why speed and efficiency is a major part of the of a computer structure. So here, a computer is an electronic device capable of performing computations and making logical decisions at speeds millions and even billions of times faster than humans can. No, we know this to be true. The next aspect here is a computer system. Now here we are looking on the different parts, right? What is it that we're going to put together to give us a full system? Yes, it is that a computer can do X, a computer can do Y, but what would make it an ideal system? What are the parts that you would need? Hence here now we have that it is a collection of components. We looking on the hardware components of a computer system, software components of a computer system, how it is that we are able to connect it with outside um, persons external of your home or where it is that you are at. So it's parts that are connected in an organized manner. Um, each part is affected by being in the system. So if it is that your keyboard is not working, how do you interact with the, 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 the systems unit? How it is that you give the CPU instructions to execute? So everything um, works together in tandem. The system has an aim, um, has an aim which is to do something. 
whether it is that you're printing, whether it is that you're listening to audio, whether it is that um, you are researching, whatever it may be, the system has an aim. And that is why you will find different systems will have different things on it. I might have a system, it doesn't have any gains on it because that is not what I'm doing. I'm not going to have a system which has um, certain, or my system may have video editor editing software on it. Yours may not because that is not what you are into. So each system has its own aim depending on the user. All right, so here it is now. We're still looking on the computer system. So a computer system is made up of hardware, and these are the physical components, the one that we can see and touch. We have the software, right? These are the programs that we will have on the system, those that we um, install and uninstall, those that we can't necessarily um, touch or not touch, monitor, modify, right? In terms of how it is that they operate on the system. So we're talking about application software and system software here. What are the communication devices that are used? Now, before, when you were doing information technology, you would look on the modem and router as hardware components, which they are because you can see, you can touch them. They are connected through your um systems unit depending on how it is that your system is wired but the communication devices are a separate entity now that you are at a higher level of study so we have hardware software computer devices communication devices we have the users which are also very important um, we know that artificial intelligence is coming up but at the end of the day the users are very important um power protection devices we find that there are systems that will have just hardware and software communication devices and user but the latter part here is not one that is um emphasized or one that one that um persons pay keen attention to or they invest in so power protection devices so all these components now they will make up an ideal computer system. Any questions here? Okay, moving right along. So we're going to look now on computer schematics. Um, so we're going to look on the full workup of a computer system.
All right, so the schematics of a computer has to do with the breakdown, the components of a computer system. That is what we are looking on here. So for the schematics here, what we are seeing is, let me bring this back up. All right. So at the top, we're seeing the computer, right? And then computers fall in two categories. You have special purpose computers and you have general purpose computers. The special purpose computers, they are designed to carry out specific tasks, right? Um, they, they, are not, they are not as, ad, it's not advanced. They are very much different from the general purpose. So the general purpose meaning that you will take these systems and do what you want to do with them. I will use mine to create videos. Somebody else will use theirs to create websites. Somebody else will use theirs to teach. So the general purpose, meaning that you are going to take it, you are going to use it for what you want to do. But the special purpose is used to carry out a specific task. So types of special purpose computers would be embedded systems and robotic devices. Embedded system would fall into the category of your remote, um, microwave, washing machine, specific things that the devices that are used to carry out specific tasks, one thing. Or general purpose computers, as you should know by now, they fall or have two components, which would be hardware and software. Without the hardware, the software can't work. Without the software, the hardware can't work. So both components are needed. For the hardware now, hardware components would be your processors, input devices, output devices, main memory, secondary storage. These make up your, the hardware components of a computer system, general purpose system. For the software, software would fall into two components, which would be system software and application software. And that's what you're seeing here. So system software would be like your operating system. It's that aspect that you need for the hardware, for the hardware to work. If you have, well, you will not be able to download Microsoft Word on your system if it is that you don't have a system software on it so your system can function cannot function without the system software but it can function without the application software so it cannot function without system software but it can function without the application software now your system software is broken down into other components so you have your program translators, you have your utilities and operating systems. Your program translators, assemblers, interpreters, compilers, and the operating system would be the OS, as we all know it. Windows being a very popular one, Mac OS, Linux, Unix, all these um, types. Utilities now would be those other applications that are needed for your system to function in terms of utilizing system resources properly. Your application software, those are those ad additional software that you would load onto your system to carry out whatever task it is that you want to carry out. So that aspect would be the computer schematics. All right, so we will be moving back to the PowerPoint. And we will be alternating 
from time to time. All right, so that was the schematics. So now we are looking on types of computers. So on your screen, you're seeing the main types that are a part of your syllabus. We have supercomputers, mainframe, otherwise called servers. We have microcomputers. Those are what we call the desktop systems. And we have mobile devices. For these components, for these components, we have to be able to classify them according to their speed, their processing power. And this would be the same structure for processing storage capacity. Um, you need to know speed, storage capacity, portability, and I'm not remembering the next one right now. And the, the, the components, types, examples, the breakdown, what are they used for? So supercomputers are the fastest computers. We know they are used mainly for simulations. They are um, single user systems for the most part. And once it is that you have some form of experiment that you want to carry out, depending on the structure itself, then you would use supercomputers. They are the fastest in terms of processing speed. They have the larger storage capacity as well not very portable so that is where they would fall in terms of their portability and their very expensive cost that was the last one cost then now we have mainframe or server your mainframes the mainframes are mostly used in organizations where it is that that would want to facilitate multi-user multi-processing systems um, banks as an example bank is the most ideal example for mainframes schools as well depending on how large the organization is where it is that you would want individuals to sign in have their own little area in in on the system itself that they will access at any time that is not hindered by anybody else so you will not be logging onto your banking platform and you'll be hearing or seeing that you can't log in. Like when um, CXC results are out, there are a thousand persons in front of you. It would not be efficient. So the mainframe would come in second in terms of all the components that I have listed. Processing um, power in terms of its portability. It is very much more portable than the supercomputers but not as portable as micro so it's portable it's cheaper than supercomputer but much more ex um, expensive hence the second so in terms of processing second in terms of portability second as well in terms of processing i'm trying to remember hold on processing storage capacity portability and cost all come in second for those your microcomputers desktop systems these systems are more affordable 
these are the systems that you will find almost in every homes everywhere you go um they are not they don't well number three they may not offer the fastest processing even though now you can basically boost your system to do what you would want it to do but in terms of coming out as is no you will have to edit it to bring up the processing power if you want more storage capacity um very much portable so it would fall second in terms of portability and it is not as expensive so we have mobile devices and there are instances where mobile devices will outdo the microcomputers and vice versa it it just depends um for these questions i find that for the last two they are pretty much subjective in terms of cost it would be mobile or microcomputers depending on what you are utilizing so mobile or microcomputer would come first so let's say mobile devices microcomputer then mainframe then supercomputers if we are looking on portability mobile devices microcomputers mainframe supercomputers if we are looking on processing it would be the same order that is on the screen supercomputers mainframe micro mobile if we are looking on storage capacity the same thing super mainframe micro mobile devices one of the popular multiple choice questions that um One of the popular multiple choice questions um, asked which computer would be used in weather forecasting. Um, the supercomputers are used there, mainframes are used there. Ideally, you have to look on what is being offered. So mainframe for me would be the most ideal response and then there are instances when persons would say that it is the supercomputer. However, both would work there. All right. So... Hardware components of a computer system, again, very much different from what it is that you are accustomed to. The higher you go, the, you will find that because you were doing introduction to certain aspects were left out and we did not go as in depth um, into the, the content itself. So here now, hardware components of a computer system, we're no longer going to draw just a box which is input processing output and storage we are going to show the connectivity between major components now so we have the input devices so we use the input devices to give instructions um once the instructions are given where does it go we're seeing here main memory right which is ram um ram is going to store what you want to do and then it will send Based on what we're seeing here, the information would now go to your processor. And in your processing unit now, you have the control unit, the ALU, we have accumulators, and we have registers, right? Accumulators and registers are always on your exam as well, so you need to know what those are. All right. So um, we look on those as well. So we have instructions going to the processor. Um, after those are completed, it goes back to main memory. What we're seeing here as well is a different category of storage. You have RAM, you have cache, and you have um, secondary storage. Now we know that main memory, internal memory here, which is RAM, that is internal to your system 
and we have cache memory. Cache memory is the fastest in terms of access. And if you look at where it is located, so cache is closest to your processor, which means that your processor can easily access data from cache um, quicker than it can access data from main memory. And we have output devices. Hope that this diagram is clear. All right. So input devices, we have different categories of input devices. Input devices will fall into two categories. We have manual input devices and we have direct data entry devices. As the name suggests, manual, it means that you are doing, you are using your hands um, to basically click individual entry, mouse, keyboard, um, the, the joystick somewhat. The Direct data entry devices means that it is much more easier than your manual. You are going to get data or instructions into the system faster. And normally what we look on are the different types of scanners as it once we are thinking about direct data entry. So here we have a list of input devices. You can find pointing devices, which would be your mouse, your joystick, um your light gun could be one as well we have our gaming devices game wheel dance um, pads we have gaming pads you can also find different types of scanners micr ocr omr the barcodes the rfids so these now are the general categories or the different types sorry types of input devices that you will find right all right continuing now we have um some other input devices here now as it relates to the input devices they are connected to your system using different ports right now we know that the port is a socket it's the socket on the computer that you will insert a cable into whether it is that you are connecting a keyboard you're connecting your mouse you are connecting a sensor whatever it may be that is that is the purpose of your port um the port is that interface between your cpu and the actual device that you are using so it it, it, it enables communication between the two now there are different types of ports or sockets that are used so we have a physical jack. And the jack is that um, section that you would insert like your um, headphones into that, that aspect there. Um, your ethernet port would also be one. That's the one that you would insert the cord into or that wire into that blue wire that provides internet um, access. Um, your USB port that would also be a physical jack as well. Um, what else? The part that you would insert your, your charger into. So those would be the ports, physical ports. We have also hardware interfaces. Um, these specify the plug sockets or cable or any electronic signal that passes through the line of the CPU um how do they work so we're looking on here we're thinking about the motherboard we're thinking about the usb we're thinking about the sata drive right and if it is that you're at this stage and you don't know about sata the ethernet um wi-fi wi-fi or
Wi-Fi or Bluetooth standards. This is what we are looking on when it is that we speak about um, hardware interface. So what it is that we use now to interface with the, the hardware component there that we're thinking about. We also have your display port and this is normally used with laptops and TVs. It's an embedded um, port, display port, that connects laptops and motherboards to your, your computer screen. So sometimes it is that you may be using your computer and you want to um, project that which you're doing on the TV. So this is what we call display ports. We also have HDMI. HDMI, anybody knows what HDMI stands for? Anybody knows what HDMI stands for? All right, so HDMI stands for High Definition Multimedia Interface. We also have USB, which, stand, which means Universal Serial Bus. And these are some of the different input um, or ports that are used to connect your input or output devices that enables you to communicate with your system. Um, we know that we have like, for example, with a wireless mouse, you're going to use the USB port with the sensor. But if you have a wired mouse, then you would use the, the jack. On to output devices. So for your output devices now, we are looking on display devices. We can look on printers. Um, so we're looking on soft copy output. What produces soft copy output? What produces hard copy output? So for soft copy output, we are looking on audio, video, um, monitors, right? That is what we're looking on. And for printers, for um, hard copy output, we're thinking about printers. Your modem is both input and output because it accepts data as well and it sends out data. So your modem would, would, would basically, it's a communication device, but in the whole realm of which category it would fall under, it would be both input and output. So monitors provide soft copy output, same thing as your multimedia projector, your voice response, speech synthesis. Um, a robot no would also provide soft copy output unless there's a printer component on it. Um, like an ATM machine would provide both soft copy and hard copy output because there are times when the information is only displayed on the screen and then at different time, you will get an actual receipt. So it would provide both. So in that instance, if you have a robot which is doing something along that line, then it would both be soft copy output and hard copy output. Now, printers fall in two categories. We have impact printers and non-impact printers. Your non-impact printers means that there is no physical contact between the printing mechanism and the paper when printing takes place. But for impact printer, the internal aspects of your printer must strike or make contact with the paper when printing is taking place. And we can think about a typewriter being the first, well, is it the first type of printer? I wouldn't say the first type, but that which we would more than likely associate with right now. So when it is that you're using a printer and you strike a key, there is a hammerhead that moves when it is that you press that key. Let's say you're pressing H and it goes right on the paper and it hammers, there's an ink on it, and it hammers um, the paper. So the paper and the printing mechanism is making direct contact for the information to be displayed. 
types of impact printer would be your dot matrix. Your information is going to come out in small dots. You have your daisy wheel, which is mostly used in hardwares. They give you the carbonated copies. They're very noisy. So most times, if you ever go to a hardware and you say you get a blue, white, or whatever copies they have, the daisy wheel printer is what would be used to make that. You have drum or chain. These are normally found in the printing industry, so where it is that they print magazines, newspapers, etc. Then now for your non-impact printers, you have thermal, inkjet, and laser. So normally the name dictates how it is that the information is added to the paper. Laser, there will be some burning, thermal, some heat, inkjet, spraying of ink. That's it. We also have the plotter, which is used when it is that you want to print on paper that is not letter size, legal size, or these other common paper size that we are aware of. So when we think about persons who are in the visual arts aspect, persons who are doing architectural work, thinking about printers for them. Microfilm or microfiche is a dark film, like what you would use, let's say, for those old time cameras, that dark film, but it the film is wider. Now, how it is that these work? Let's say it is that you are working in an organization or there's a particular organization that collects data. What will happen is that from time to time, they may find that they have data that is no longer used, somewhat dormant, but they can't discard of them because the possibility exists that two, three, four years down the line, they may need information from it. So instead of getting rid of the data and trying to wing it, what will happen is that they will compress the data and they will print it on these microfilm. And yes, and that is where the data will be stored. All right, so now we are moving on to main memory and storage. I'm going to share uh, Google Docs at this time. So please allow me a minute. Well, I just realized something. I didn't need to stop sharing. Okay. All right, so now we're looking on main memory. And we know that main memory is what we call primary memory. That is what you would all know. But for those who did know, it's also called simple simply memory now main memory here once it is that you hear this two things should come to mind ram and rom read only memory random access memory for your read only memory we know that as the name suggests it is read only there is no writing that will take place by the user on a daily basis so writing is going to take place, which can be hardwired when it is that it is purchased by the manufacturer, or you can get it blank where it is that you would add your data to it. But after you write your data to it, depending on the type of read-only memory, then you cannot edit the data again. So here now what it is saying is that ROM is a special type of memory that is built onto the motherboard and pre pre-programmed by the manufacturer. Same thing as the hardwiring that I was telling you about. 
what does it contain? It contains those instructions that are necessary for your system to work, right? Um, and this is called the booting information. Now, when you turn on your system, your computer is going to run a BIOS, which is your basic input-output system. So it's going to ensure that the input devices that are connected, they are, they are seeing where it is, it is working. Um, same thing for the output devices, whatever security measures that you have in place in terms of the protocols of what should be loaded, right? So this is what will happen. Now, these things are built on in terms of the features. And we know that you will set your password or whatever when you get the system. But in terms of the structure itself, these things are hardwired at the time of manufacturing. Now we have different types of ROM. You have PROM, EEPROM, and EEPROM. Now your PROM can only be programmed once. Once and after that, if it needs to be reprogrammed, you have to get a next ROM. You can't change data that is on it. EEPROM, which stands for Erasable Programmable Read-Only Memory, can be programmed twice. Give me a minute. All right, I'm back. Trying to excuse the noise. I seem to live on a very busy street today. All right. So we have EEPROM, as I said, which stands for Erasable Programmable Read Only Memory. Now, EEPROM can be erased twice. EEPROM, which stands for Electronically Erasable Programmable Read Only Memory, can be. Um, the data can be modified and erased multiple times. So you can continue doing so until the, 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 the ROM chip tells you that I cannot take anymore, right? Multiple times. Now, the key point that you need to note for these three, how many times they can be reprogrammed, how it is that you reprogram them, right? And um, so, hold on, how they can be reprogrammed. How many times they can be reprogrammed right and that is an important part so for ram ram now is random access memory so it is going to store all the data that is currently in use by your system now when we speak about the main memory here we speak of volatility for ROM, when your system loses electri e electricity, the data that is on RAM does not change. It is not lost, right? RAM, on the other hand, is sensitive to the absence of electricity. So once it is known that there is no electricity stem going to the system, then all your data will be lost, right? So you have a flash drive and you want to open your computer science IE. When you open, when you access your hard drive and you click open on your computer science IE, that IE is moved from your hard, from your hard drive or from your flash drive to RAM. So it is not accessing the data from your hard drive anymore. Why? Because your processor needs to move fast, right? The location of your hard drive and the location of RAM, RAM is close, very close to the processor. So it means that it can back and forth in terms of communication very quickly. So your data that is stored on your flash drive is moved to RAM so that when it is that whatever instructions are given, it can be done quickly. 
and that's the purpose of your RAM chip. So these now are images that would represent how it is that your RAM chip can look. And that is the part that I was saying that RAM is volatile, um, meaning that once it is that there is no electricity, all your data will be lost. And here it is saying it is made up of semiconductor material, CMOS. I'm sure this is not the first time you're hearing of CMOS, CMOS battery. Everybody must hear about that once it is that they, they have a computer system. So CMOS stands for Complementary Metal Oxide Semiconductor. All right. So what we find now here is saying that new microchips are typically gone up with no less than one GB RAM. Um, this data is somewhat outdated um, as well because we know that one gigabyte of RAM is nothing right now. You need anywhere um, upwards um, from eight, four, eh, four not bad, but eight would be the most ideal so from eight upwards all right so ram is used to store data inputted to the computer it holds um the operating system so just like i would have explained before as it relates to as it relates to your your data that is on your flash drive is the same thing happens with your operating system when you turn on your computer the operating system that is on your ram chip um rom sorry rom moves to your ram and then when you turn off the system it goes back but the difference is that if you open a word document and the operate between the word document that is opened and the operating system is that if you lose electricity the operating system nothing happens to it but if it is that you are working on the word document once it is that there is no electricity whatever changes were made before all of that would be lost so it stores um, input stores data inputted into the computer holds the operating system any application that is running and sometimes that is the issue because if you have a ram chip that is one gigabyte like in this case let me change it from no no less than four it would be ideal though um if it is that you have a ram chip that is low in storage or very small in storage here what will happen is that once you start opening many applications it starts slowing down So what are the different types of RAM? So we have two types of RAM. We have SRAM and we have DRAM. So we have static RAM and we have dynamic RAM, right? I want you guys to all know that these information, we're not just giving them because we want to give them for giving sake. We have to know these things, right? So your static RAM, is faster right but it has no refreshing meaning that um it doesn't update right but loses a lot of power and generates a lot of heat so that is not going to be ideal right however your dynamic ram it's going to do those or it's going to have those features which would be the drawback of your static ram so it has a refresh right so it's going to refresh itself it's not as lot noisy and it doesn't generate a lot of heat all right how are your ram chips classified so we have sim and we have bim so before the same thing we have sram and we have dram now we have sim and bim so sim stands for single line memory module and dim stands for dual line memory module so let's look on the two so for sim and dim 
right? They are, what you're looking on is the pin, pins and notches that are on the, the, the motherboard in terms of how it is that you connect the RAM chip to the motherboard, right? So the DIM has two notches and the SIM has only one. That is how you can differentiate between the two, right? So we have one, two, we have one notch right here. There are therefore not interchangeable, right? So that means that if it is that you have the motherboard that is um, only accepting DIM, you won't be able to fit the SIM and vice versa, right? Um, a particular motherboard is built either to use SIM or DIM and is less expensive, but DIMs have a 64-bit path, which means that it has more storage capacity, more space than your SIM. All right, so let's look on cash. I'm sure that for the persons who have phones, they will often see um, cash memory. And if it is that you are seeing cash memory, um, oh, what I was saying, from you hear the word cash, you should know what it means, right? Anything that is frequently used on your system is stored in cash. Why? Because you can be able to access it faster. It is closer to your processor than RAM. I remember that we said before that RAM was very close. So in between your processor and RAM, that is where you find cache memory, all right? So anything that is frequently used, that means that you open this application daily, right? And when you open this application, this is where you will go to. So it loads faster, it is stored in cache. So it says, a high speed holding area for frequently used programs, instructions, and data. That is what cache is. Cache is about 10 times faster than RAM and it takes less time to access, again, because of its location, right? It's not just the fact that it is, it, it is located further from the, the processor, it's its location. That is why it is easier to access. Cache may be a special chip that sits between the processor and RAM. So we said that part before. All right, so let's look on data storage. Once it is, we have different types of storage. The one that we are most common, bits, byte, um, kilobyte, gigabyte, terabyte, petabyte, yottabyte, zottabyte, um, exabyte. These are different storage um, size, right? One time when we heard of kilobyte, it would be like, whoa, that's a lot of data, right? But what we're seeing now is that really and truly, Gigabyte is not really a lot, right? So the smallest unit of storage is a bit, right? And then eight bits, sorry, four bits make a nibble. Four nibble makes a byte or, because a lot of persons don't seem to know about nibble, what you have is that eight bits make one byte, B-Y-T-E. And then from a byte, going up, you have a 1,024 or 1,000. So 1,000 bytes, right, 1,000 kilobytes is going to make a megabyte, and 1,000 megabytes is going to make um, a gigabyte. So each time you're going up, you're going up by 1,000 or 1,024, it is fine. So bytes to kilobyte, 1,000 or 1,024. Kilobyte to megabyte, 1,000. Megabyte to gigabyte, 1,000. Gigabyte to terabyte, 1,000. Terabyte to petabyte, 1,000. Petabyte to exabyte, 1,000. And then zettabyte, um, exabyte to zettabyte, 1,000. And from a zettabyte to a yottabyte would be 
a thousand or a thousand twenty four as well. Now, some terminologies that are not looked at would be bits, um, well, bits and bytes, fine. Characters will come out in um, what characters? Problem solving. When we talk about fields, records, and files, we're thinking about um, other kind of documentations, right? But a character, just like in a program, is any word, is a single thing, one. It's a, it's a letter, sorry, not a word, a letter, a number, a special symbol, a punctuation mark, or even a blank space, right? Those are characters. Fields now would be those individual cell that you're going to enter either a character a word um a bit a byte whatever it may be records are combination of fields right and a combination of records will now make files good there's also a word so word is the amount of bits that a computer can process at any given time or in one operation and that is a very um, popular multiple choice question, All right? The next one is word length. That is not here as well. Word length has to do with the number of bits in a word, All right? These are all popular multiple choice questions that you may find. So here it says now, so the data stored in files in, in secondary storage, right? the information must be filed and must be stored in a directory. A directory now is where. So let's say, for instance, you have your C drive, right? That is where it is stored. But in the C drive, you have a folder, which is my documents. And in my documents folder, you have a next folder, which is SDs. And in that folder, you have um, computer science. And in the computer science folder, you have your IE. So all of that now will give you the directory for your file. On a disk, the directory is either FAT or MTF, which is master file table. And sometimes if you look on the extension, that is what you will see. So what are some terms that we need to look here on? And these terms you should have been exposed to from fifth form when it is that you were looking on the hard drive. So one is access time, right? So it's a time lapsing between the request of you transferring data. Sorry. Hi. Right. So um, access time. That is the access time aspect. Then here it is, the word and the word size that I would have mentioned before. Another terms that are seek time that would have um, come out, and that is how long it takes for the head of your secondary storage, specifically your hard disk, to get to the right track in terms of the data that it is looking for. Latency is also another one. And latency, L-A-T-E-N-C-Y, is how long the data, how long it takes data to rotate around the head of a secondary storage, specifically your RAM. So specifically your hard disk, sorry. All right, back to the PowerPoint now. All right, so on to our next slide. All right, so computer memory. So for your computer memory now, we're looking on RAM, ROM, cache. We spoke about DRAM. We spoke about SRAM. We spoke about flash memory. Flash memory is your, um, your flash drive. Your memory stake is... 
your memory stick is that component that you would use like in your cameras, digital cameras, virtual memory, um, video memory, and BIOS, basic input output system. Virtual memory came on the paper last year, but in the wrong category. So most persons um, who did that part didn't get the mark for it. So you can look out for that component. All right, so what are we looking on here? We're looking on an image of, hold on, let me see if I can zoom. We're looking on an image of the computer memory. So at the top here, we have the CPU register at the top. Then we have cache and we're seeing here for cache memory, that we have different levels. We have level one and we have level two. Then we have RAM, which is physical and virtual memory. And notice it says that these two are temporary, right? So temporary in the sense that once it is volatility, once it is that your, oops, once it is that your data is, hold on. Once it is that there is no electricity, your data will become lost. All right. Um, here now we have our storage device type. So we have RAM BIOS, BIOS. We have removable drives. We have network, internet storage. We have our hard drive. And these are permanent storage area. Though you can delete the, the data that is on it, it is more permanent than what we had above. And then below that, we have our input sources, such as our keyboard, mouse, removable media, scanners here, so remote storage, other devices. So the, the middle part here would be your computer memory, right? And here we're seeing where we have temporary memory and we have permanent storage areas. Not getting a lot of questions from the chat. So I'm hoping that persons are following. All right, moving on. We're now on to secondary storage and for the secondary storage you must know how to characterize these in terms of their capacity right and capacity means the volume of data that it can store access speed how easily can you access these data and their access method method and portability so that's four things you need to characterize these by capacity access speed access method and portability so here it is saying now secondary storage is needed because it provides um a longer a more permanent method of storing right it is not volatile like ram right and you can use it as a means of backing up data and archives right so th those are some of the main reasons why persons would venture into secondary storage other than just sticking to primary storage. So for your primary storage, where here we have a floppy disk. Now your floppy disk is obsolete no longer utilized um no longer around right um floppy disk so normally we would talk about a 3.5 inch floppy disk and that would be its size now your 3.5 floppy disk um is made of a flexible material but the external of it would be harder so it protects that um coating that magnetic material that is inside of it which is used to store data now typically your um, floppy disk could only store 
um, 1.44 megabytes. Not a lot of data, right? And if you are to go onto your system now, you'll realize that 1.44 megabytes is really, really small. There's, I, I can't think of one thing that you would have on a computer that would be of that size. All right, next thing now we have what we call our zip disk. So your um, a zip disk is both internal and external. Oops, hold on, come back. All right, so your zip disk is both internal and external. So it would be like a hard drive that can be both an internal hard drive or an external hard drive. Now, these devices have been, they have evolved. So before we were looking on, typically they would store like 100 megabytes up to 750 megabytes of data. But, um, that would have changed no now the zip disk were more durable and portable than your floppy disk right it provided more storage capacity than the floppy disk it was floppy disk was portable the zip disk was also portable as well so portability there in terms of how you access it for you to access the data on a floppy drive you would need a floppy disk you would need a floppy disk drive same thing now for your zip disk you would utilize um what did they use for zip disk thinking about it because the zip disk the internal one is um attached to your motherboard which means that if it the external one would be utilized using either jacks or ports right now your floppy disk sorry your zip disk would have been more expensive than the floppy disk but they also provided read write function and they provided read write function meaning that you can access data you can add data to it better than the floppy disk it was popularly used to um back up the data that you have on your hard drive especially if it is that your hard drive was becoming full and you needed to clear it. So you would use the, 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 the zip disk to basically um, store those data. Hard disk now. So hard disk, what we're thinking about for hard disk, we're thinking about your flash drive. You know, I need to look up a picture of the zip disk. All right, for your hard disk, we're thinking about the hard drive. So we're thinking about um, a hard exterior, but made of aluminum coating. Very rigid, which means that it would be, it could take certain kind of conditioning, especially for clumsy people like myself, better than the other two that we would have discussed before. Now your hard disk had multiple heads um, and it was used to store a large volume of data now we think about platters um spindles we think about the disk um storing data on concentric rings so we think about like a cd you know like when you play on a cd and say track one track two track three that is it but for each ring you could store data on the top and on the bottom right so we have concentric rings that are called um trucks right and they were all divided into sectors now but then and i'm sure it would have evolved sectors could store anywhere from 256 to 512 bytes but as i said um with the fact that more storage is required as it relates to certain things no these things would have changed now, a set of tracks on a hard disk is known as a cylinder. So we talk about track, we talk about um, sectors, and here we are at cylinders. All right, next thing we talk about here, we have the optical disk. 
Where optical discs, we're thinking about CDs. CDs and DVDs. Once you say optical disc, that is what we're talking about. Normally, for us to add data to optical disc, some type of burning is going to take place. All right? This is why I always hear persons are going to burn data on a CD. So because it uses laser beams. Um, there are different types of optical storage. Now, it does not provide a large storage capacity. It is larger than the floppy disk but not as large as your zip disk or your hard disk, right? So, um, right, so that is it for your optical disk. For your optical disk now, those you would need, if it is that you want to add, they provide read-write function with some of them. Um, if it is that you want to add it, you would need specialized software and you would need a CD um rw drive which allows you to write to the cd and it allows you to um read data from the cd or dvds so typical type now we talk about cd r rom which means that you can only read the data from it and the cd rom normally asso are normally associated with um are normally associated with applications. You know, when you purchase like an application and they tell you that you get the CD so you can load it on it, right? Installation. So those type of CDs would be CD-ROM. They don't want you to edit the data that is on it. They don't want you to erase the data that is on it. So it comes that you can only read the data from it and nothing more. There is CDR. Um, and CDRW, which means that you can read data to it or you can rewrite data on it. Same thing with your DVDs. Now, DVDs will provide more storage than CDs because CDs, audio files, DVDs, you're thinking about videos. So those normally take up more space or have more storage capacity than. All right. Moving on now to ma magnetic tapes. So as it said, it is a tape. When you think about, think about a reel of tape. It's just that this reel of tape was made from magnetic coating. So the data are stored in tracks that would be similar to your hard disk. And these tracks, what they do, instead of going around in a circle, it just run the entire line of the tape. So on a CD, you will see like track one, track two, track three, and it goes around in a circle. But on the magnetic, on the magnetic tapes, it would run in a line like, you know, like a hundred meter race. They have line one, line two, line three. Those would be the tracks. Um, for your magnetic tapes, um, you have what we call frames, and frames would represent one frame would represent one character um and a particular tape could hold anywhere from up to um nine depending on the the type of magnetic tape now magnetic tapes where would you normally find this you will um normally use it not where would you normally find it when would you normally use it you're going to use it when it is that you want to back up data right because it's going to allow for the fast transferring of data it is also very inexpensive and has a very high storage capacity all right that that stands for digital audio tape and that is like it's a small cassette yeah, um, I don't know. It uses sequential storage. Um, you know, when it is that you have 40 information stored on a cassette tape and you want to access 30, you have to first go through the 29 to access 30. Um, so that, that is what we're talking about here, digital audio. Going back to the days of when it is that you had to fast forward and rewind and all these things, right? So cassette tape we're thinking about here. 
these were also very low in terms of its storage capacity um they went up to about 20 20 megabytes give and take they were also used when it is that persons want to back up pictures and sounds so like they that would be used and if you can look back on older videos probably well black and white are colored where it is that they would be using like these tapes and the tape would reel from one to the next and play out or the little cassette tape that you would put in your radio. Thumb drive, we all know of. So they're compact and they do, they're very much portable. One time they weren't, they didn't offer a lot of storage capacity. But what we're seeing now is that flash drives, um, they have evolved significantly and they offer a lot of storage capacity they do right all right so we are now 16 of 22. so here we are looking on the processor but i think i'm going to leave the processor because the processor is going to be a video by itself because the processor is a lengthy topic so i am not going to touch on processor right now you will look out for the video just for processor by itself as you can see here, I have three different documents, and these three documents are anywhere between six, six to nine pages each. All right, so we're now at power protection. And as you would have said before, for this component, we find that large organizations find and utilize and see that this is very important. And as such, they they um invest into power protection but why do you need to protect your system from the power that is that is used to run it right so from the different power supplies and here in jamaica we will speak of gps in other areas i'm not sure what it is but you know we have the is it 110 or 120 and we have the two 220 anyways we have these so we have different voltages that you would get depending on what it is that you're doing so we're seeing here in jamaica using jps we get 120 volts um frequently however the power is fed into the power supply unit on our pcs is not 120 volts so sometimes they get high and sometimes they get low depending on what is happening and these can cause serious damage not just to the data but also to the equipment that you are using So, I think I have this twice. Hold on. Oh, I have this twice. My apologies here. Okay. So, here now, what we're looking on are the different threats that we can um, experience from the power supply that we get from our company our, our power supply company because of um, irregular voltages right so these threats arise from public power supply as well as whatever is happening in your immediate environment not in all cases you will find that it is the the, the sole fault of your um, power supply company sometimes there are trees that are growing on the line sometimes persons may hit into a pole and it topples down and this may cause issues as it relates to what is being fed to your system so we have threats what are the different threats that we see here we have what we call sag or brownout so this is like a short dip in voltage so if you're supposed to be getting 110 like for a short period of time you will just see your voltage go down and then it just comes back quickly right um this can cause damage to the equipment and in some cases it may not be you may not get anything from it from your power supply company so what will happen is because it dip you may find that your equipment start freezing so it starts to lag. You may find that if it is that you were transferring data or you were um, 
saving data, what will happen is that data becomes lost or it is corrupted, right? Um, there. So then we have surges. So sags are dips, surges are increases. So this is where you have short increase in voltage. And just like the sag, it causes damage to your equipment and your data as well. So what it will do, it will cause your system to stress itself out because it's getting more than what it ought to be getting, right? What does it do with that? Sometimes your system may burn up, right? Then now we have spike. So the spike now is a very short but dramatic high jump in your voltage. So notice now surge is a short increase, but the spike is very short. So you should be getting 120 and boom, in the blink of an eye, you get 200. Your system mash up, right? Your system is damaged. Um, sometimes what you'll have, uh, this, this can be resulted from, let's say, lightning, power outages. Like when the current goes, electricity goes, and then it comes back. When it is that there's a lightning strike, for example, right? These can cause serious damage to your hardware and cause your data become lost. Sometimes it's not necessarily where it is that it's going to become damaged in terms of your data, but it, you just lose your data altogether. Noise. Um, noise. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that you are not thinking about noise, noise as in sound, but I'm not sure if you have ever heard sounds coming from your electrical plugs. It's like a, I, I really can't explain, but sometimes there's noise in terms of static that um, is occurring when there is electronic signals in the atmosphere. Um, sometimes, I'm not sure if you have ever experienced it, Sometimes when you go close to it, like a television and when you put your hand in front of it, you will feel like some furry things that's there. Something along that line. That is the static that we're, we're talking about, right? Um, it cannot be avoided. And what organizations may try to do is to use something that's called a vacuum. But it's not that it is going to prevent it it's not going it's not going to prevent it altogether there are instances where it might work and other instances where it is it doesn't it is natural right so it's not something that the your your power supply company can change change per se because it is a natural element um that happens in the atmosphere as it relates to electronic signals um what does it do it causes glitches in your software and data will it damage your hardware no not necessarily but where we find that it fault is where it, as it relates to the software that is being utilized and data that is currently in use so blackouts or power outages so this is a total loss of power um, if you have never experienced this, like kudos to you. Um, but I am sure that most persons would have experienced a blackout at some point in time, especially here in the Caribbean, where it is that we are exposed to different um, natural disasters. So these can be caused from different instances. Natural disaster could be one as well, where it is that there are accidents, where it is that there are sometimes. I think there has been one case where it, well, here in Jamaica, where there was a blackout because of persons who were striking. So different, different, different elements may lead to. Um, what can it cause damage to? It can cause damage to your RAM. It can cause damage to your hard drive. So we're talking about hardware here. It can cause damage to your data hardware and data so both ways it goes there all right so those were the threats how do you protect yourself from these all right with the exception of the um 
static, as I was saying before, that cannot be avoided. But for the others, you can put measures in place to protect your data and your hardware, data, hardware, software from these threats. Because it's not like your power supply companies that are, let us give them a spike. Let us give them a surge. Let us give them a sag. Let us have a blackout. These are things that sometimes they have no control over. All right. So power protection devices are designed to control the power being fed to the computer equipment. And one point that I need to add as well is that sometimes we cause damage to our devices as well. Because, or let's say for a laptop, your laptop um, charger comes with specific instructions that is on it. And very regular persons will come and they will say, can I borrow your charger? And they will use your charger and you plug it in. Either your charger probably burn up or their system start malfunctioning. It's not charging because the two are not compatible. The amount of voltage that should be going to your system, that charger is either giving it too much or too little. So we need to be careful with that as well. All right, so back to power protection. So there are three types of ways that we can, three ways that we can protect our devices, data, or software. So we can use what we call surge protectors. Now, the surge protectors, voltage regulators, or UPS. The surge protectors, what we have been finding is that persons have been utilizing the 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 extension with multiple sockets but not because it comes with multiple sockets means that it is a surge protector the surge protectors are specifically designed to do that so there are persons who may have this thinking that it's that when it is not and then their devices become destroyed they become disgruntled because they're trying to figure out how or why did this happen all right, so surge protectors, they are designed to operate in a particular voltage range. Range. <laughs> voltage range. Um, what it does, it disconnects or cuts off the power if the voltage being supplied goes outside of the range. So if it realizes that I'm supposed to be getting 110, but 120 is pushing off, pushing, it's just going to shut it off, right? So that is the surge protector. Your voltage protector now, it uses electrical circuitry. And what it does, it actually changes the voltage that is being supplied. So if you're getting too low, it's going to top it up, right? And if it is that you're getting too high, it's going to decrease it. So let's say, for instance, your system is getting, is, 110 is needed for your system but your company is only giving you 80. It's going to top up the electricity so that you will be getting your 110, right? If it is that the, the company is sending 200 and you're only supposed to be using 110, then what it will do, it will decrease it so that your system is just getting the right amount that is needed. And UPS now is mostly used when um for blackouts. You can think about this for the blackouts because it will give you some system will say up to two days, some will say eight hours. You will get power supply because there's a battery inside of it, which while it is that there's electricity, it's just charging that battery. So once it is that the electricity goes, it will provide electricity um to the system so that you can continue saving that which you were saving without interruption or you can continue working or it gives you time to basically properly deal with the outage that exists so there is not any damage to hardware software or data and last slide now what we're seeing is power protection in terms of its effectiveness. So you have surge protectors, voltage regulators, and you have UPS, especially with the fact that the surge protectors are much cheaper, right? They are cheaper than the other two and they are just as effective. But the effectiveness also will depend 
on the organization and what it is looking for. So if it is that you want, when it is that electricity goes, the system does shut down until the generator chips in, the UPS would be the best thing there. Depending on where you are, if it is that you're constantly getting high and low voltages in the organization, then they may use, they may more go for a voltage regulator than a UPS because they don't have situations or they um, don't have um, frequent situations where it is that they are without electricity. So it all depends on the organization. All right, so... With that said, we have completed module one, and I'm going back to the objectives because we would have completed, and we're going to look on those. We have looked on the purpose or the main components of a computer system. We have not done the building blocks, um, which is two and three. We have looked at how data is represented in a computer system briefly. And I said to you that we are going to leave the processor for last. So we have touched one, four, and five briefly. All right, so I will make the a general announcement or post on the channel so that you will know when it is that we will have our next session if you know anybody doing unit two tomorrow will be a session for those students doing unit two and we will be looking on module one as well do have yourself a wonderful rest of day hope it is that you are all making the necessary preparations for the upcoming exams, especially since there have been no considerations for these students who would have started late.